I must confess, as a microbiologist, when I was putting this presentation together, I kept, I kept drifting towards an animal health perspective. And, and I've tried to, to combat that and put it to a well-being perspective. But toward the end of the talk, if, if I haven't satisfied some of your questions, please feel free to challenge me. I guess, like any good story, like Lewis Carroll says in uh, Alice in Wonderland, it's best to begin at the beginning. And as far as a, any animal goes, our microbiological journey begins at birth. Because unless we're ill or sick already, most animals are born or hatched sterile, it's particularly with the sterile gastrointestinal tract. And most of my talk will be about a gastrointestinal microbiology. Uh, and so an animal has to acquire their, their flora or their healthy normal flora after they're bor born or hatched. And conceptually, you know, inside the gut is outside the animal. You know, so it's still an external environment to the animal. If you look at it, it's a tube within a tube. You know, it's, it's like the, the hole in a bagel or a donut. You know, that's, that's outside the animal. And so even though the microbial population that becomes established there performs almost a function of an organ, it's still outside the animal. And so the, the microbes come from outside. And there appears to be a certain amount of randomness to colonization. But that randomness is important, and what's really important is the timing. There appears to be benefit for a microbe to get there first. <coughs> this slide, there are more modern ways of looking at this natural colonization, also called succession. Uh, but this, this slide really shows it nicely. When an animal is first born, uh, the first organisms to colonize the gut are your uh, lactic acid and strep type bacteria. Bacteria that would be common to the birth canal or the skin flora of the, of the maternal dam. Uh, and that happens very rapidly. Several days later, you start to get some coliforms and enterococci bacteria. These are facultative anaerobes. Uh, these begin to reduce the oxygen tension within that gut environment and really establish an anaerobic environment so now that your pure anaerobes can come in and establish. And they don't show up until about two weeks later. And these, these real strict anaerobes are thought to be the predominant bacteria contributing the beneficial role to the gut function. And as these anaerobes become established, then your uh, facultative bacteria, like your coliforms, your E. coli types, and your salmonella types, they begin to diminish. So if you can get an anaerobe there first, it's very difficult for a salmonella to become in and get established. Uh, again, the prevailing dogma is, is that the young neonates acquire their flora from their mother. Uh, certainly there's suckling and grooming activities, and they can also get it from the straw in the environment where the mother is at. Uh, the normal flora can also be acquired by fostering. It's not necessarily mother-specific. Uh, again, it, it, it's acquired from contact with the host and the, the inoculum. Conceptually, it's, it's attractive to think that the normal flora may be host species specific. So that you, it's, it's nice to think that what's the flora of a chicken is, is special to a chicken and the flora of a pig is special to a pig. But there's little evidence to support that, at least for the predominant bacterial species involved. Uh, in the gut, there are 300 to 1,500 species of bacteria that potentially exist within that gut. And the vast majority of those are generalists. And so they don't care. All they need is a nice, dark, warm, stinky, anaerobic environment, and they're happy. Uh, and so this is a, a diversity chart from chickens, but it would look very similar if you, if you had the same chart from a pig or from a cow or from a human. And that's, these are the predominant bacteria in just about every gut population. And they're the overwhelming bacteria. Now that's not to say you might have some specialist, a very low, low numbered organism within that gut with a special activity, 
but you know we really don't have the sensitivity in our microbiological methods or our molecular methods to detect those yet. And so the cases of substantiated cases of beneficial microbes being host specific in function, origin, or in host are relatively few. Conversely, there are, in fact, there's probably more cases where a pathogen might be host specific. There are certain E. coli serotypes that are pathogenic to pigs but not to other animals. There are salmonella serotypes that are pathogenic to chickens but not pigs and vice versa. Um, and then naturally with cattle, natural succession occurs the same way. The calves obtain their inoculum, they become inoculated by contact with the dam or the environment that the dam lives in. Naturally, with the rumen, uh, it's, it's a much larger and a more complex uh, uh, colonization because it takes a fair bit of time for that rumen to mature to a, to a functional rumen fiber degrading organ. And then also for ruminants, there's evidence that some sort of scratch factor from, from a fibrous type diet or something like that is quite beneficial both for rumen development and even for cattle that are in high concentrate diets. And, and a lot of this that I'm presenting are examples of things that you're quite familiar with. Uh, I'm just trying to put kind of a spin on it here for well-being. Now there are some cases where uh, an animal might be precluded from contact with its mother. Perhaps the most easy way to think about it would be with eggs, where they, they take eggs away from from the breeders and they clean up the eggs a bit and they put them in a in essentially a sterile incubator. In this case these chicks would be hatched and by three days of age they're placed onto the, the broiler floor, onto the litter of the broiler house and they have had no real good contact with their maternal flora from the mother. And so because in the old days they used to get contact with the nest, fecal material in the nest and feathers and stuff like that. And so here there might be a case where you might want to help jumpstart that, that inoculation process with normal flora that would be in a product, an inoculum of some sort. And that's, that's been shown where competitive exclusion cultures are common in Europe and, and there, are, there are some types that are present in the U.S. Most of your, in the United States, most of the competitive exclusion cultures that are sold nowadays are really just yeast type cultures or lactic acid bacteria that would be similar to something you would find in yogurt. But there are some uh, products that essentially have harvested microbes from a healthy adult chicken and grown them up and then they apply that back to the chicken. And that does seem to jump start the colonization process. Uh, this is the numbers of anaerobes in the gut of, of uh, chicks treated with a competitive exclusion culture. You can see there are several orders of magnitude, so that's 3,000 times greater numbers of bacteria in the gut of those chickens than in the chicks that had no treatment. And this is just an electron micrograph of the epithelium of those chicks that were treated at, on day of hatch, uh, and then three days later they looked in, at the epithelial system. One nice thing about conceptually to me, uh, this, this treatment was applied by spraying the chicks. And this is a way to take advantage of an animal's normal behavior to introduce uh, a treatment. Because the chicks like to preen themselves. And when they preen themselves, that's when they inoculated themselves with this bacterium. And then by, by comparison, this is the crypt of the epithelium of a chick that did not receive that competitive exclusion culture treatment. And so, there is some evidence to suggest that you can jumpstart that colonization process when animals have been precluded contact with their flora from the maternal dam. And this just shows that this competitive exclusion, these uh, anaerobic populations within the gut do provide a function, in this case in excluding salmonella. That's the term exclusion is that they exclude unwanted bacteria from colonizing. You can see and this is at 52 days of age. So something that was applied at birth was able to preclude or exclude salmonella from colonizing the gut of chicks even 52 days later when they were processed. Uh, and the 
concept behind competitive exclusion then is that either the, the beneficial bacteria attach to attachment sites in the gut and keep the pathogens from binding, or they compete for nutrients, or perhaps they produce uh, antagonistic compounds against encroaching pathogens, or they perhaps even stimulate the immune system. Once that, that, that anaerobic microflora is functionally established in, in an animal, then there are certain things that can perturb that gut flora. And I've just listed some of them here, and I'll go through a few. Uh, certainly, transportation stress was recognized early on, particularly with salmonella, as, as causing increased shedding of salmonella. Shedding, particularly in cattle and swine, has been shown to increase salmonella shedding. Uh, you can you can anticipate that transportation would be an, an anxiety causing event for for animals, particularly cattle. You know, I used before in my previous life before I started college, uh, I used to drive truck and haul livestock, and and any time you work cattle, you know they, they they defecate a lot all over themselves. Well, that can that volume change within the, the gut can actually change growth rates of bacteria in the gut because the dilution rate really establishes microbial growth rate. Uh, it's reasonable to think that bacteria that are very rapid growers, like Salmonella and E. coli, would have a faster chance to grow than your more slow-growing anaerobes. Uh, also, feed deprivation during, during transportation. Animals don't get a chance to eat when they're, when they're being chucked someplace. Uh, during that feed deprivation, and concentrations of fermentation acids that the gastrointestinal flora normally would produce decline. Uh, these, vol these fermentation acids or volatile fatty acids are inhibitory to a lot of bacteria, particularly Salmonella and E. coli. And so as those concentrations go down, then they're not inhibiting E. coli and Salmonella anymore. And then also, as in the case of poultry, as chickens become hungry, you know, they'll pick at the litter. And so they could perhaps re-inoculate themselves with Salmonella or something like that. It used to be think. It used to be thought. I think that, at least in the case of swine, some of the the transportation effects would cause a recrudescent of a latent salmonella infection. And I think that's not the case anymore. That dogma is is somewhat been disproved. More recently, now I think people think that it's really transportation event for swine. It's really a very rapid acquisition of of a salmonella infection. Pigs either pick up salmonella on a truck some a salmonella that they haven't been exposed to before, or have no immunity against, or even when they get to, to the abattoir or the slaughter plant in the holding pens. You know, they can acquire that infection and it can translocate to the lower gastrointestinal tract in a very short period of time. And I think that's the common idea of, of the salmonella effect in swine anyway. Weaning can also represent a major stressor to the gut ecosystem. Uh, again, you have anxiety, whether it be separation from the from the dam, commingling with with unfamiliar animals. Again, you have feed change, feed deprivation. And animals may not uh, resume their intake right away, and so sometimes there might be opportunity to try and jumpstart this or, or minimize some of the problems associated with these kind of stressors as well, particularly with swine. We've shown, you know, application of a competitive exclusion type culture similar to that with poultry to swine helps pigs when they're weaned to combat E. coli infections, some of the consequences of E. coli infections. Here you can see the average shedding of E. coli, uh, the concentrations of E. coli in the gut compartments, the ileum or the cecum, and mortality were markedly reduced in animals that were treated with beneficial flora uh, just before they were weaned. Uh, Commingling uh, provides another stressor, not just a stressor, but also provides opportunity for the kindergarten effect, where you have all these animals with their own unique floras. Some of them may be a carrier of a pathogen and a chance to, to disseminate that through a herd. And, and that's probably a case. Uh, certainly, uh, Tom Besser, Washington State, reported in uh, 2005 that in Western Washington and some feedlots, 
cattle coming into the feedlot had a very low prevalence of Campylobacter, about 1.6%, but near finishing that prevalence had increased to about 68%. And they hypothesized that it was really the, the density, the stocking density within that feedlot and the intermingling of these animals that perhaps contributed to that. Uh, there are other hypotheses, uh, perhaps some diet effects may contribute, but they have not been uh, established yet. And then molting and laying hens, certainly that's, that's an issue that's been of concern for welfare rights people for quite some time. Uh, traditionally, molting was done by, by feed deprivation. Uh, I think now we have, there are researchers who have come up with several alternatives to feed deprivation for a molting process, and essentially they, they feed a relatively indigestible substrate uh, to the animal, to the bird, and something like alfalfa. And that alfalfa keeps the anaerobes going and keeps the concentrations of those inhibitory volatile fatty acids at a high enough level to inhibit salmonella from, from coming in, but still the animal is in a negative energy balance and, and uh, molting proceeds. Again, diets can also influence the gut flora of animals and animal well-being, uh, but this isn't re restricted just a type of uh, production setting. It's not just a conventional or an organic or natural living setting. It can happen in any of these. And it's not just an intensive or extensively rare situation. Uh, certainly in cattle, acidosis is a common problem that, that can happen when cattle come into a feedlot and are, are brought up to a high concentrate diet. Uh, and you're all familiar with the runaway fermentation that occurs when these readily fermentable carbohydrates are fermented very rapidly and you get the decline in pH and your bloom of lactic acid bacteria in the rumen. Uh, likewise bloat, uh, whether it be feedlot bloat or frothy bloat during grazing, uh, can cause distress to animals. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Dr. Chang, <laughs> He used to give this presentation, and with this slide, he'd always talk about the power of the rumen with this forceful ejection of, of digesta. Um, but really, this is another thing that can happen, but it's not just limited to convent, you know, feedlot type sit situations. It can happen in idyllic pasture situations where cattle come out or sheep and, and have uh, access to really lush grass and, and fermentable substrate. Uh, with the, the pasture bloat, a lot of it is due to extracellular polysaccharide, which entraps gas. The, the microbes have access to readily soluble uh, amino acids and, and protein. These essentially uh, produce a biofilm that traps the gas and prevents the animal from being able to rectate that gas. In feedlot settings, it's more of a gas bloat. And here you get a very rapid decline in, in methanogenesis. Uh, one thing that happens when you reduce methanogenesis is you get more gas accumulating. Uh, according to the ideal gas laws, one mole of hydrogen is this, occupies the same amount of space or volume as one mole of CO2 as the same amount of space as one mole or one unit of methane. Well, if you in inhibit the production of methane, you have five times more gas than you would with the same amount of atoms in methane. And so you can see you can get you know, a lot more gas produced when you inhibit methanogenesis. You know, cattle industry, livestock industry in general is under a lot of pressures. You know, they want us to do things that are good for the environment. They also want us to be, you know, really careful for the animals. Uh, animals grazing, cattle grazing is thought to be, you know, a more natural living situation for animals grazing. But animals grazing produce more methane. They want us pr to reduce methane. Uh, if you want to reduce methane in cattle, the best way to do it is to put them in a feedlot. And, and so there's some disconnects there that the public also has to come to terms with. Uh, and then also there are lots of um, poisonous plants or poisoning situations that can occur during natural living situations as well. Uh, certainly uh, grass tetany for uh, dairy cattle, and this is something you would think would be desired, you know, uh, an animal gets to go out in a nice green pasture, less green pasture. 
uh, cases of nitricon poisoning, uh, lots of other poisoning. Some of these can even be uh, addictive to the animal. And the microbes in the, in the gut can contribute to these poisoning. And I'll try and give an example here. Uh, in the United States and Canada, there are nitric compounds, certain plants synthesize nitric compounds that can be poisonous to the animal. Uh, primarily, poisoning is caused by these four varieties and species of astragalus. And these are all three nitro one propanol synthesizing plants. It's a little bit confusing, but 3 nitro one propanol is not toxic per se. Uh, it's converted by hepatic alcohol dehydrogenase to 3 nitro propionic acid, which is the toxin, which it looks like succinate and it inhibits succinate dehydrogenase, which is an enzyme in your Krebs cycle or cellular respiration. So it inhibits cellular respiration. Well, in ruminants, 3 uh, nitro one propanol exist as a glucose conjugate, as an ether glycoside connected, so 3 nitro one propanol is bound to glucose. Ruminants have beta glycosidase activity. Uh, monogastrics lack microbial, we don't have beta glycosidase activity. So you can feed this to pigs or to rats and they're not poisoned because this compound stays linked together. But ruminants have that enzyme, the microbes have that enzyme, that liberates 3 nitro one propanol 3 nitro one propanol is absorbed more rapidly and metabolized by rumen mi microbes less rapidly than 3 nitro propionic acid. So it's more toxic to ruminants. So here you have a case of a microbe making something that's not toxic, making it toxic. Conversely, nitro propionic acid, which is, is the actual toxin, is relatively not poisonous to ruminants. It, it is at high concentrations, but it's less poisonous than nitropropanol. That's, in the rumen, ruminants also have esterase activity, but monogastrics, mammals, we have esterase activity too in our stomach. And so we can hydrolyze that, that bond and liberate 3 nitro one propionic acid. And we can absorb that and we can be poisoned. In the rumen, 3 nitro one propionic acid is absorbed more slowly than 3 nitropropanol, and it's metabolized more rapidly by the rumen microbes than 3 nitropropanol. And that's why ruminants are less susceptible to poisoning. And so the microbes can contribute. You can, ruminants can acquire tolerance if you adapt them. And in a lot of these cases, animals can acquire a tolerance if you adapt them over time to different changes. This just shows that there's a rumen microorganism that can degrade 3 nitro one propanol uh, and you show if you inoculate animals, you can enhance that uh, detoxification ability. Uh, diets can also contribute uh, substances that cause the microbes to produce uh, undesirable odors or even noxious compounds, such as ammonia, sulfides, and indoles. Uh, and these, when they accumulate to high, high enough concentrations, can actually impede animal health. Uh, persistent exposure is thought to be bad for human health. You know, people who work in uh, swine operations with high concentrations of these gases are thought to have uh, be at risk to respiratory uh, disease. Animals don't usually live that long, you know, so they don't come into some of these long-term exposures. Uh, one of the compounds, indole, tryptophan is, a, is an amino acid provided in diets. It's metabolized to, to indoles. And these indoles, particularly skatol, uh, can contribute to, to respiratory dysfunction and to, uh, to bore taint. Uh, and so it's possible that there are some microbes that can degrade indole. And some microbes that like actually take indole and make tryptophan. So if we could exploit that, that process and possibly we could uh, minimize effects of bore taint and maybe uh, non-surgical castration uh, procedures of swine might be more more efficacious. There are also some uh, compounds, some certain nitric compounds that'll inhibit uh, indole or skatol production as well. And so we're thinking that maybe there's a way to, to reduce uh, accumulation of skatol in the gut and, and reduce bore taint. And then finally, I guess just to close up, uh, 
to reemphasize some of the things that Jim had mentioned, there's really no good evidence to support the concept that that organic or natural living situations are better for food safety. Uh, there, the data is all over the board, and there's nothing really consistent. Uh, there is evidence to suggest that the gut flora and the gut ecosystem has a has a great propensity to adapt over time to very serious changes. Uh, and I think the best thing for animal agriculture is that a herdsman, an experienced herdsman, who can really, you know, use that to the best of his ability. I really think, you know, the value of a herdsman cannot be uh, minimized. That's that's where the real power comes from.